All right, how's everybody doing today? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, writer, and historian. Well, first of all, I want to say Happy New Year to everybody. We made it to 2022. Today is January 1st, 2022. Okay, so hope everybody's doing well. Uh, a lot of you have heard about a, a 10 week online course that I teach uh, on the weekends. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade with what they didn't teach you in school. So uh, this class I teach on Sundays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I want to come on and do a brief overview of uh, what we cover uh, in the class. It's a fantastic uh, course. People that take it really, really learn a lot. And uh, you can register for this class and join us um, in our ne next session, okay? Uh, we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. And I'm gonna post the information here so you can register for the class as well. So uh, we look at history chronologically and we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place, okay, number one. And we cannot start our history uh, in slavery. We cannot start our history in slavery. We have to deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to uh, the transatlantic slave trade uh, taking place. So I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips, uh, everything. All right. And you can also listen to my uh, radio show and watch my uh, Facebook live broadcast and YouTube. I'm on Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to midnight Eastern Standard Time and Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, the African History Network show on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, uh, WFDF here in Detroit. Follow me on my Facebook fan page, The African History Network, and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P, because we broadcast there as well. So here are some of the things that we deal with in the online course, okay? And we deal with uh, archaeological discoveries, ancient African history as well. And we look at what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. So we look at what was the transatlantic slave trade? What were some of the events that led up to the transatlantic slave trade starting? What role did Christopher Columbus play uh, in the transatlantic slave trade and the spread of it? Because Columbus is um, crucial and central to uh, laying the foundation for slavery, racism, capitalism, and the exploitation of indigenous people. Even though the transatlantic slave trade basically starts about 1441, before Columbus set sail on his uh, first of four voyages that he set sail on August 3rd, 1492. But um, the, the transatlantic slave trade really spreads with, with Columbus conquering uh, various islands and, and territories on behalf of the Spanish crown, okay? Uh, Haiti, well, Hispaniola, and we know the western third of the island of Hispaniola is where Haiti is. Um, Panama, uh, Panama, Honduras, the Bahamas is where he lands August 3rd, 1492. He calls it San Salvador. So we deal with uh, uh, Columbus and we, we look at things like the Asiento de Negros, which uh, really helped the transatlantic slave trade to spread. We look at when did Africans first come to the U.S. as, as slaves? Did uh, Africans sell themselves in the, in the slavery? We deal with that complicated history. Uh, were African people in the Americas before the slave trade? Yes, we were. And this was our land stolen from us. Uh, if we look at some of the work from uh, one of my friends, Dr. David M. Hotep, who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans, documented evidence, uh, we can see that. And this is, uh, I've interviewed him probably about 13 times now. And uh, this is something that we deal with in the class also. We look at uh, archaeological discoveries that are causing scientists and paleontologists and archaeologists to rethink everything. And also we look at the African presence in the Americas going back tens of thousands of years. And on page, uh, his book came out in 2011, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence, page 11. He deals with uh, evidence uh, discovered in Allendale County, South Carolina, by Dr. Albert, Go Dr. Albert Goodyear, who's an archaeologist at the University of South Carolina. In uh, 2004, this discovery was made. They found 13 different types of evidence thoroughly documenting an African presence um, in South Carolina, the territory that today we call South Carolina. 
dating back at least 51,700 years ago. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints in lava, genetic M G genetic M174D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics, linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeleton structures, and tools. They found 13 different types of evidence thoroughly documenting an African presence in this country dating back at least 51,700 years ago. Okay, so we have to look at the archaeological discoveries as well that are causing uh, the scientists and archaeologists to push the timelines back. Um, we look at things like, um, uh, so we look at the African presence here in the Americas going back tens of thousands of years. We look at the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, who take the teachings from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt and the Nile Valley region of Africa into Europe. These teachings are going to bring Europe out of the dark ages. And it's going to be to our detriment. Everything we taught them, uh, they, it comes back to kick us in the behind. We look at shocking archaeological uh, discoveries that are causing experts to rethink everything. Uh, insurance companies that uh, took out insurance policies on slave ships and enslaved Africans on the plantations as well. Um, and, you know, one of the insurance companies early on, founded in 1845 in um in the new york area is was the nautilus mutual life insurance company and for the first three years they sell about 500 policies on on um, african slaves on, on plantations and then they're going to change their name to the new york life insurance company okay and they and they've been pretty forthright with this history also the new york, there was a big article from the new york times a few years ago around 2016 or so 2016 2017 that dealt with uh, this history in, in the New York Life Insurance Company talking about selling uh, insurance policies on uh, African slaves um, early on in the first three years that they existed. But this was something that took place. So not only um, on selling insurance policies on slave ships and, and, and the Africans on those ships, but also on the plantations as well. Uh, we do a Freemasonry, America and the Founding Fathers. OK, in, in the uh, in Freemasonry has its origins in the teachings coming out of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. Uh, we look at the origins of the terms uh, America and Africa as well. Uh, we look at the problem with slave movies. Why are we being bombarded with uh, slave uh, uh, slave themed movies and slave themed TV shows, even though that's an important part of our history. But other parts of our history largely are not being made into movies, especially when African people ruled civilizations. This is largely not being made into movies. The closest thing we're coming to that is Black Panther and Wakanda, which is a powerful movie. And there's 11 different African cultures infused into the film Black Panther. But Wakanda, even though Wakanda is a real word, Wakanda is a fictitious African nation. Uh, we do it. Asar, Aset, and Heru, and the origins of the Immaculate Conception story, which is really, really deep. And this even ties into um, a Christmas, okay, and the uh, why uh, Christmas is celebrated on December 25th in the winter solstice. All, all of this is connected. Uh, if we look at uh, now, there are a number of different books that I reference in the class. You don't have to uh, buy any of these books, okay. And if we look at um, Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus, two of the books that I use are Egypt on the Potomac by uh, Tony Browder and Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder. Those are just two of the books. Christopher Columbus and the African Holocaust, Slavery and the Rise of European Capitalism by Dr. John Henry Clark is another book as well. But if you look at this here, dealing with Asar, Aset, and Heru, um, and uh, Osset, who the Greeks called Isis, wife of Osar, mother of Heru. Um, and Osar is going to be resurrected after he's killed by his brother Set and his body, body cut up into 14 pieces. Um, 13 of the pieces are recovered. The 14th piece, the phallus, is not recovered. So a Tekken or, or what the Greeks called an obelisk is, is erected uh, as a symbol of resurrection and that 14th piece that was not recovered. But Aset uh, or Isis, uh, Aset, I should say, means she of throne and uh, the netter or deity Aset is associated with love and fertility. But when you look in Europe, even before the Moors go in in 711 AD, 
you see the um, worship of the Black Madonna and Child. And, and we look at some of the statues of the Black Madonna and Child, which comes from Osset and Heru. And the Black Madonna and Child was worshipped all throughout Europe. OK, and then with the rise of European powers, we're going to see the decolorized version uh, of that. And we see Michelangelo paint the Sistine Chapel. And he uses his uh, aunt and uncle as the images of Adam and Eve. And he paints God as European and the angels as European, things like this. So with the rise of European powers coming out of the Dark Ages, going into the Renaissance Age, coming out of the 1400s going into the 1500s, we're going to see the rise and the dominance of the European phenotype. OK, and we're going to see the uh, suppression of that African phenotype. And we'll we'll see um, a lot of images that were traditionally African images. We see them become reinterpreted as European images. But very quickly here, if we look at page 95 of now about the contributions to civilization by Tony Browder. And um, Browder talks about the story of Osar, Osset, and Heru uh, is the uh, first story in the recorded history of man of a holy royal family, the Trinity, Immaculate Conception, Virgin Birth, and Resurrection. Now, if we back up and go to uh, at the top of page 95, he, uh, Browder talks about in 1984 at the Nile Valley Conference in Atlanta, Georgia, Dr. Charles Kofer uh, professor of Old Testament, professor of the Old Testament at the Interdenominational uh, Theological Center in Atlanta, discussed the role of Egypt and Ethiopia in the Old Testament. He stated the following in the King James and Revised Standard Versions of the uh, of the Bible or the Helios Biblos, the Sun Book, Helios in reference to Sun of the Bible, the word Egypt or Mitzrayim in Hebrew, along with cognates occurs some 740 times in the Old Testament. The word translated Ethiopia, and we know Ethiopia is a Greek word, okay, referring to sunburn. Ethiopia was called Abyssinia, but Ethiopia, we'll go with that. The word translated Ethiopia and or Cush Kush in Hebrew, uh, along with cognates and including three instances, instances of duplication in the references, appears 58 times in the King James Version. Now, also, anybody who reads the Bible, the Helios Biblos, I would, I would encourage you to get a study Bible as opposed to reading from a devotional Bible. Because my King James devotional Bible is about 400 pages. But my King James International Study Bible is 2,000 pages. So with a study Bible, there's a lot more information. There's uh, language references, translations. There's a lot more information so you can understand what is actually being talked about and written in the Helios Biblos, the Sun Book, the Bible? So, if you don't know the difference between a devotional Bible and a study Bible, you're probably reading from a devotional Bible. My study Bible also came with a CD ROM as well because I bought it like 10 years ago. Okay, now. In a lot of these stories in the in the Helios Biblos, the Sun Book, a lot of these stories are retelling or retelling of ancient stories from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, Sumer, Mesopotamia. These stories that take you right back to yourself, take you right back to ancient Africa. So uh, the word translated Ethiopia and or Kush, along with cognates and including three instances of duplication in the references, appears 58 times. In the King James Version, in this version, the translation Ethiopia is used 39 times, Cush untranslated with cognates 19 times. The numerous references to Egypt led uh, led one Old Testament scholar to remark, quote, no other land 
is mentioned so frequently as Egypt in the Old Testament, end quote, to understand Israel, one must look well into Egypt or Kemet. Kemet meaning the land of the blacks, one of the original names of Egypt. Now, the story, Browder goes on to say, the story of Asar, Aset, and Heru is the first story in the recorded history of man of a holy royal family, the Trinity, Immaculate Conception, Virgin Birth, and Resurrection. Evidence of this Trinity is known to have existed in ancient Nubia or ta or ta as late as 3300 BCE or BC, BCE meaning before the Common Era or BC, as late as 3300 BCE. Carved on the walls of the Temple of Luxor, circa 1380 BCE before the Common Era or BC, are scenes that depict the following. Now, this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Just because you never heard it before, disagree with it, or don't like it, does not mean it's not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. So these scenes are depicted here in the Temple of Luxor, circa 1380 BCE, the Annunciation. So down at the bottom, you see the panels. So we see the Annunciation. We see the Neta de Huti, uh, uh, announcing uh, to the virgin all set the coming birth of their son Heru, the Annunciation. Okay, now in the in the story in the Bible is is Gabriel the messenger angel that delivers the message to Mary the Virgin. And when you look at the uh, when you look at the constellation of Virgo, Virgo in Latin means virgin. In ancient times, that constellation was a constellation of all set the virgin to the immaculate conception. We see the, the netter or deity Neph who represents the quote unquote, Holy ghost and the netter het Heru who the Greeks called Hathor are seen symbolically impregnating offset by holding ox, which is the symbol of life or the symbol of eternal life or the African symbol of life, the ox holding the onk, holding onks to the nostrils of the virgin mother to be all set. This is the immaculate conception. Then three at the top, the virgin birth. All set is shown sitting on the birthing stool and the newborn child is attended by midwives. For the adoration, the newborn Heru is portrayed receiving gifts from the three kings or the three ma or the magi in the Bible, it doesn't say how many, but the three kings is also in reference to the three stars in Orion's belt, Orion the hunter. And we know that the, the star Sirius is in the uh, the the constellation of Canis Major, the big dog. So Sirius is also known as the dog star. All this is all this is connected. If you saw the presentation I did dealing with. Um, the winter solstice. And why Christmas is celebrated on December 25th and the winter solstice, December 20th, December 21st, December 20th or December 21st. So the presentation I did uh, December 21st, 2021, dealing with the winter solstice. We connected all this stuff together. All this is connected. The uh, our set is shown sitting on the birthing stool. Uh, oh, sorry. The newborn Heru is portrayed receiving gifts from the three kings or magi while being adored by a host of gods and men. So then we look at the uh, story here of uh, uh, the secrets of Isis. Sat Saturday mornings, I used to get up and get a bowl of cereal and some Cheerios or something like that, uh, shredded wheat or what have you. Because I, I, my mom wouldn't let me eat like the real sugary cereal, the Fruit Loops and Lucky Charms, things like this. And I'll watch the Shazam and Isis Hour on CBS, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Saturday morning. OK, the Shazam and Isis hour. And they, they had this TV show called The Secrets of Isis. And they showed this white woman. Who whose name whose name was Isis, she was a superhero, she was a teacher by day. And then she just had super superhuman power. She can fly in the sky. And she gets her powers from ancient Egypt. And they called her Isis, but they didn't say that Isis. This Isis was a copy of an African woman. African queen or offset 
who the Greeks called ISIS. We had no idea. They just they just co-opted this, reinterpreted it through the European cultural filtration system and fed it back to us. And then we're sitting here looking at this this white woman do all these amazing things. And we're like, wow. OK, <laughs> on Hulu a few years ago, I was watching some episodes of The Secret of Isis. In the beginning, they talk about Het Heru or they call it Hathor. They start mentioning some of the names of the of the Netaru and all this from ancient Kibbit. They just hijacked our stuff and don't say, oh, these were African people. And, you know, this is from African culture or anything like this. They just give it back to us. And we think they're amazing. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, let me get back. Let me get back to this here. OK, so. So these, these are some of the things we deal with. Now, also, we look at, and I want to go back to this here. Um, we look at uh, the shocking archaeological discoveries that are causing uh, experts to rethink everything. One of the discoveries we look at is from um, 2017, June 7th, two, it was June 2017, that deals with... Um, well, there's one coming from 2017 that deals with the mastodon skeletons found in um, California that date back about 130,000 years ago. But there's another one that deals with um, this one right here that deals with the discovery in Morocco. <laughs> and this is blowing people's minds. Now, now, here's what's interesting. A lot of these archaeological discoveries. I read about and there was one that just came there was one that just came out of egypt also that i'm going to talk about uh on the african history network show there's one that just came out of egypt december 28th 2021 okay um ancient pharaoh or nesubiti because nesubiti would be the term that we used ancient pharaoh reveals secrets after his mummy is digit digital digitally unwrapped okay the, their discoveries coming out every other week and what what's really interesting when these discover when these discoveries come out is the information is not hidden because all the news outlets pick up these stories um now you may only see 20 seconds or 30 seconds of it on msnbc or cnn but they have all the uh when you go google these topics all these articles they have articles all the news outlets have it i'm looking at yahoo news nbc uh washington post new york times national geographic they all have articles on this but if we look at this one here quickly and this stuff coming out of uh uh egypt every other week definitely ancient pharaoh reveals secrets after his mummy is digitally unwrapped, the technique enabled me to visualize the amulets in between the layers and to visualize the face, one researcher said. Okay, now this is from December 28th, 2021. And it talks about uh, Egypt, Egyptian scientists have unwrapped a 3,500 year old royal mummy without peeling away a single layer of embalming linen. Instead, they used advanced X-ray technology and computerized tom uh, uh, tom uh, tomography scanning to catch a glimpse of Nesubiti Amenhotep I or Pharaoh Amenhotep I mummified body and the secrets it has harbored for millennia. Now, Zahi Hawass, who's a prominent Egyptologist and one of the scientists involved in the research, said, quote, for the first time, for the first time, we can know information about the mummy without disturbing the mummy. For the first time, we can know information about the mummy without disturbing the mummy. mummy. OK, so this is just one of the recent archaeological discoveries. But there was one from um when i was looking for is this is from 2017 june 7 june 7 2017 we're older than we think this is nbc news also national geographic washington post new york times they all have stories on this all you have to do is just google the topic 
new find pushes human origin back 100,000 years. New find pushes human origin back 100,000 years. Did paleontologists just find the greatest granddaddy of them all? So when you go through, and I read a number of different articles from different sources on this discovery. This was a discovery in Morocco, okay? North Africa. This is a discovery in Morocco. New discoveries at a rich site in Morocco show modern humans were hunting and probably cooking game animals 300,000 years ago, 100,000 years earlier than scientists have believed until now. Because all this stuff is much older than we've been told that it is. Site near Morocco's coast and the city of Marrakech has always yielded interesting human remains. But they, but they had been dated to around 40,000 years ago. New discoveries and new dating methods show that, in fact, many of the bones belong to modern homo sapiens, modern man, homo sapiens. And they lived as far back as 300,000 or 350,000 years ago. Now, the earliest previous homo sapiens bones date back 195,000 years ago, and they're from clear across the continent in modern-day Ethiopia. Taken together, the findings show modern humans were dispersed across Africa long before anyone ever thought. So, as I've said numerous times before, the deeper they dig, the, pla the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. The deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. And when, when you go read these about these archaeological discoveries, and I've, and I've read about a lot of, a lot of them because we deal with them in the class, they, the, the, the scientists are saying, we have to rethink everything. They're saying, they're saying we have to push the timelines back, and they said we have to start looking in places for evidence that we didn't think to look at before. And this coincides with a lot of research from Dr. David M. Hotel that deals with, you know, the African presence in the Americas dating back tens of thousands of years ago, things like this. Okay. And then and there's new evidence that came out of Brazil uh, a few years ago. New York Times had an article about this, pushing the African presence in Brazil going back about a hundred thousand years ago. All right. How's everybody doing? Everybody share this broadcast on your social media platforms. If you're just tuning in, I'm Michael M. Hotel, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, writer, and historian. And we're doing a, a brief overview of a 10-week online course uh, that I teach called Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Okay, uh, You can register for it at our, at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, um, africanhistorynetwork.com. Right on the homepage, we have the information. And I teach this class on Sundays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Then also on Sundays, uh, that, that's on Sundays. And on Saturdays, I teach uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. We have a special bundle pack uh, right now where uh, you can register for both classes for only $70. They're regularly $130 each. Okay. And we'll post the link here again. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips, all that um, uh, in the class. Even after you can watch, we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. So a year from now, if you want to go back and watch like January 2023, if you want to go back and watch the entire class, you can do that. You, you'll have full access to it. OK, this is also something good you can use with your children. Uh, I would say the content is PG-13, okay? It's not crazy. I don't do a lot of cursing and things like this. It's not overly graphic or anything like that, okay? Um, but, yeah, you can use this with your children also. It's very engaging. Uh, we have a live text chat in class, so you can ask questions. You can see me in class. I can't see you, so it's not like a Zoom call for work. You don't have to worry about um, seeing, uh, you know, being seen in, in class or anything like that. Okay, uh, some other things we deal with, uh, the link between ancient Kemet 
and um the link to uh to ancient kemet or egypt and early christianity freemasonry in america the fake willie lynch letter 1712 because willie lynch never historically existed the willie lynch letter has been proven to be a fraud um professor manu and pym has done a lot of research on this i've interviewed him a number of times uh professor manu and pym uh out of uh california contra coastal college in california and also i've done a couple lectures on this as well and uh it was written the letter was written about 1970 by dr kwabina ashanti so we have to study real history this language there are words in the willie lynch letter that didn't didn't even exist in the early 18th century and the syntax structure of the english language coming from england was different than the language that was used the syntax structure of the language in 1970 in the u.s uh we also do with the influence the african influence in the film black panther because there are 11 different african cultures uh that we see represented in the film black panther also okay now i i talked about um and and this information here is really important because one the, the attack we see on critical race theory and this false this false concept by uh many republicans of what critical race theory is they've just lumped everything that they don't like dealing with race and racism and teaching of slavery and white supremacy and things like this in schools they just lump this under a banner that they call critical race theory it's not really critical race theory critical race theory is not basically taught in k-12 through schools it's taught in graduate schools and law schools uh mainly it's taught some in um undergraduate level but mainly in law schools and graduate schools it's a legal analysis but this article right here this is from um which one is this this is from um uh, august i mean this is from uh march 2nd 2021 mock slave auctions racist lessons how u.s history class often traumatizes dehumanizes black students okay uh and then this one here also republican state lawmakers want to punish schools that teach the 1619 project so we see the attack on the 1619 project we see uh the the using critical race theory to uh reduce what can be taught about slavery and and racism and even the civil rights movement is some of these crazy laws coming out of these states especially southern states uh th this was a good article here from the new york times uh, 60 percent of Americans know little or nothing about Juneteenth. This is from uh, June 2021. 60 percent of Americans know little or nothing about Juneteenth. And even what a lot of African-Americans know about Juneteenth, it really needs to be corrected because the Emancipation Proclamation uh, did not free uh, the, the African slaves. It's going to be the 13th Amendment ratified December 6, 1865. Now, some of the uh, other discoveries we look at uh, there was a good, um, um, so we, of course we look at African civilizations. We talk about the, like the Khoisan who Dr. David M. Hotep deals with, and they have the oldest DNA, oldest DNA on the planet. The Khoisan were here in this land we call the United States of America, at least 51,000, several hundred years ago. That was the discovery that Dr. Albert Goodyear made. This is an article from sciencedaily.com, sciencedaily.com. And uh, it deals with Dr. Albert Goodyear's discovery. Then this article is from November 18th, 2004. New evidence puts man in North America 50,000 years ago. Now, you can still go read this article. ScienceDaily.com is a scientific website. They have they talk about scientific discoveries and archaeological discoveries, things like this. The article is still there. You can go read it. OK, it's almost 20 years ago. Uh, here is a summary of what the article says. Now, this is not my summary. This is the summary from sciencedaily.com. Radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains while artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County, uh, Allendale County, South Carolina, by University of South Carolina archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. Okay. And this is Dr. Albert Goodyear. He's a white archeologist. Now he gets attacked by the establishment archeologist because his, um, his research 
and what he discovered is being suppressed and really challenged because this goes against the Clovis culture discovery in New Mexico that the oldest human, uh, oldest evidence of, of humans in North America is Clovis, the Clovis culture, which dates back about 13,000, 14,000 years ago. Okay, this discovery here in 2004 blows Clovis culture out of the water, but also the discovery in California that shows uh, that that uh, with a discovered mastodon skeletons that date back 130,000 years ago. And they said that the skeletons, the way they're broken, had to be broken by humans, which puts humans in California uh, 130,000 years ago. Well, the um, only people on Earth 130,000 years ago were African people. So, and if you look at uh, this article here, the, the Atlantic has uh, stories on this, nature.com. Uh, let's look at the one from nature. Nature.com, NBC News, all, all the outlets have uh, stories on this, okay? And, okay, the one from nature is hard to read. You can try to read that on your own. Uh, National Geographic here. Hopefully I'm logged into my National Geographic account. I have subscriptions to a bunch of different news sources. Um, I can't keep up with all of them. They just keep charging me. Let's look at this. Let's look at this one right here. This is one of the discoveries you deal with in the class. Humans in California, 130,000 years ago. Get the facts. A new study has dropped a bombshell on archaeology, claiming signs of human activity in the Americas far earlier than thought. Now, this is from April 26, 2017. How many people heard about this discovery? This is from April 2017. This article from National Geographic. NBC News has an article on it. Washington Post. All the outlets have stories on this. Okay. Now, you, you may not see it on, on, on TV that much. Okay. On cable news. But CNN has articles on this. NBC News. All of them. In an announcement sure to spark a firestorm of controversy. Researchers say they found signs of ancient humans in California between 120,000 and 140,000 years ago, more than 100,000 years before humans were thought to exist anywhere in the Americas. OK, now this ain't this is not me saying this. This is this is this is what the scientists are saying and the archaeologists and the paleontologists. If the researchers are right, the so-called Cerruti Mastodon site could force a rewrite of the story of humankind. Now, just back up for a minute. Many of our African Center scholars, like Renoko Rashidi, who we who passed away August 2nd, 2021, and Renoko was a friend of mine, I interviewed him a number of times. Renoko Rashidi, Dr. Charles Finch, Dr. David M. Hotep, and others, many of them have been saying that, uh, uh, Homo sapiens are not 70,000 or 100,000 years old, but like 300,000 years old. Modern man is not, it's not 70,000 to 100,000 years old. Modern man is like 300,000 years old. They've been saying this for years. Okay. I realize now this, the, the, uh, the, the leader of the study, Tom Demir is a paleontologist at the, uh, the San Diego Natural History Museum. Tom Demir said, I realize that 100,000 years is really is a really old date and makes our site the oldest archaeological site in the Americas. Now, when this discovery came out, I emailed Dr. Dave Hotel the article from NBC News because NBC News has an article on this as well. And I said, Doc, this is this is what we've been talking about. And they're coming out with the discoveries. OK, incidentally, Los Angeles, like half the half the people who discovered Los Angeles were Afro uh, Afro Latino. OK, from Mexico. OK, the, the city of Los Angeles, half the people that discussed were, were Afro Latino. OK, for people that didn't know. 
because we know California used to be part of Mexico. California becomes a state in the union um, after uh, the, the, the California becomes part of the United States because of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo of 1848, which is the treaty that ends the Mexican-American War of 1846 to 1848. I teach about this in, in, in my other class from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power 1865 to 1968, because we deal with uh what leads up to the civil war taking place and then we deal with 1865 to 1968 and one of the things that leads to the civil war uh is precipitated by uh the mexican-american war of 1846 to 1848 and because of the treaty of guadalupe hidalgo the u.s gets the territory that makes up california arizona new mexico colorado utah and nevada and nevada they get that for about 15 million dollars for mexico mexico loses about a third of their territory OK, and then we know we know Texas wins its independence from Mexico. Texas wins its independence from Mexico in uh, 1836 and Texas becomes a state in the union in 1845. OK, the year before the Mexican-American War starts. All right. Now. Um, let's go back to this here. Okay, so oh, I want to go back to the one from National Geographic. All right. So uh, Tom Demir goes on to say, to be clear, the team has not found human bones at the site, which is true. But as uh, uh, Tom Demir and their colleagues tell it, their evidence, a mastodon skeleton, bone flakes, and several large stones show that the area was a bone quarry where an unknown homonym allegedly smashed fresh mastodon bones with stone hammers, perhaps to extract uh, marrow, bone marrow, or to mine the skeleton for raw materials. However, many of the world's leading experts in American archaeology already have expressed some form of skepticism to the paper's claims. Some have rejected it outright. John McNabb uh, of the University of Southampton, archaeologist at the University of Southampton, says the earliest occupation of the Americas is a highly contentious subject. And the research from and the discovery from uh, Dr. Albert Goodyear undermines that whole Clovis culture um, notion that the earliest humans were in the America in North America 13,000, 14,000 years ago. Quote, the date of the find at 130,000 years ago is a really big ask for archaeologists who are under who are who are used to talking about 12, 13, 14,000 years ago. That's the Clovis culture. It is it's a big, big time difference. OK. And one of the things they talk about here in this discovery. Is that. Um, scientists, paleontologists who are experts in different and differentiating between when a, they ex, they're experts in differentiating between. Um, what mastodon skeletons look like smashed by humans against smashed other ways okay i didn't even know that existed but that's what that discovery deals with all right so these are some other things that we deal with in the class and we go throughout history it's a 10-week online course like i said we do the sessions live all the sessions are archived and recorded you can join us live or you can watch them anytime you can watch from around the world um, this discovery right here was one that the New York Times wrote about in 2010 on Crete, new evidence of very ancient mariners. This article is from February 15, 2010. Okay. And, and that's why we, in the class, we go through and look at this history, um, chronologically in like 50,000 years and look at the history chronologically. And we have to look at these archaeological discoveries and we look at things that lead up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place, then go through and analyze the transatlantic slave trade. 
on Crete, new evidence of very ancient mariners. Now, this is from New York Times, February 15, 2010. You can go read the entire article. Proper documentation ends all conversation. You don't have to believe a word that I say. You can go research this yourself. Stone tools found on the Greek island of Crete over two summers, over the course of two summers, archaeologists say, are at least 130,000 years old. There's 130,000 years again. Okay. Now, this article I found out from Dr. David M. Hotel back in like 2011, and I went and researched this. Okay. There's 130,000, that 130,000 years again, and a different discovery. This discovery here is considered strong evidence for the earliest known seafaring in the Mediterranean and calls for rethinking the maritime capabilities of pre-human cultures. These, these discoveries are causing the scientists to rethink everything. Now, Crete has been an island for more than 5 million years, meaning that the tool makers must have arrived by boat. So this seems to push the history of Mediterranean voyaging back more than 100,000 years, specialists in Stone Age archaeology say. Previous artifact discoveries had shown people reaching Cyprus, a few other Greek islands, and possibly Sardinia no earlier than 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. So, so they're saying they have to rethink all this stuff. They, they keep having to push the timelines back. Now, this article is, is 12 years ago. The deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. Here's a screenshot of the actual article from the New York Times. You, it's not in the fiction section. It's in the science section. You go read the, go read the entire article. On Crete, new evidence of very ancient mariners. Okay? All right. And then we deal with discoveries like Thomas Heraklion, the lost city of Egypt that was revealed in 2013. OK, and they found uh, uh, 100, uh, 150 feet beneath the surface of Egypt's Bay of Abu Kir. They found 64 ships, 16 foot tall statues, 700 anchors, countless gold coins and smaller artifacts. Thomas Heraklion was built around 8th, 8th century B.C. and it was just swallowed into the sea. These are some of the statues they found buried uh, 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 at, at the bottom of the sea from Thomas Heraklion. When we deal with, I talked uh, a few minutes ago about the Tekken that the Greeks called an obelisk. The Washington Monument is a Tekken because we know that 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons. And we know that the foundation of Freemasonry comes from the teachings from ancient Kemet, from the mystery systems in ancient Kemet. The word Mason is derived from the Latin words mass and sun. Mason means child of light and expresses the desire to pursue light, which is a metaphor for the sun, which symbolizes knowledge. The term child of light or sons and daughters of light was first used to identify uh, students who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. Many Masonic temples were modeled after the temples of ancient Kemet. Places where light or knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees. Because like when you read uh, uh, Stolen Legacy by George G.M. James, he talks about the liberal arts and the concept of liberal arts colleges comes from the seven liberal arts taught in the mystery schools in ancient Kemet, the rhetoric and the logic and arithmetic, things like this. The concept of getting your credentials in a series of degrees comes from ancient Kemet, associate's degree, bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD, right? So when we go back and study all this, this takes us right back to who we are. This reconnects African people to who we are, to our history and culture. Read pages 18 and 32 of Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. That's one of the books we use um, in, in the class. You don't have to buy any of these books to follow along in class, but these are uh, some of the books that we use in class. And once again, uh, so, so we have the class on sale right now. So this class meets on Sundays, 12 noon, the 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach in the school. And you can uh, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register right here for it. Uh, it's right on the home page. And as soon as you register, you can start watching the content. You can watch the class from last week. 
Um, we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it any time. E even a year from now, you can go back and watch the entire class, okay? The classes are regularly $130. We have a special bundle pack for a limited time only, so you can register for both of the online courses that I teach. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school, where we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the Transatlantic Slave Trade taking place. And then the other class I teach on Saturdays, uh, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Okay, this second class picks up where understanding the transatlantic slave trade leaves off. Okay, and I've been teaching understanding the transatlantic slave trade. I've been teaching that class going back to 2017 on and off since 2017. And um, there's so much information in that class. I didn't have I didn't have the time to adequately deal with the period of time of 1865 to 1968, like I really wanted to. So I had to create the second class in with from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power. Each class, we go through and analyze approximately a 10 year to 15 year period of history each class, okay? To really see what happened after slavery ended, what happened after Reconstruction ended, Reconstruction 1865 to 1877 to understand the laws and policies put in place to put us in the predicament we are in right now to understand where we need to go from here. And when we see what takes place in reconstruction ending and uh, we see the Jim Crow laws put into place in the state constitutions being rewritten in the, in the 1890s, uh, like with Mississippi, uh, November 1st, 1890, Mississippi adopts uh, their new state constitution that imposes poll taxes and literacy tests. And this it, this becomes known as the Mississippi plan is, and it's adopted by other southern states. OK, uh, South Carolina, 1895, Louisiana, 1898, um, Alabama, 1901. We see Georgia and Virginia, Oklahoma. All right. And they're they're attacking and suppressing the African-American vote and taking back control of state legislatures from uh, that. Many of those state legislatures, it was a, uh, a biracial um Republican Party that was in control of those state legislatures. All right. And the same thing that happened in the 1890s and early 1900s, we see taking place right now, but is the Republicans doing this? Okay. Because this is after the party realignment took place that started in 1928 with the Lily White movement of 1928, where Republicans started pushing African Americans out of the Republican Party when Republicans appealed to segregationist Democrats in five former Confederate states in the 1928 presidential election because Republicans wanted to get Herbert Hoover elected as president. And they started ignoring the needs and concerns of African-Americans and ignoring the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, which dates back to 1915 in the movie, The Birth of a Nation, when the movie, The Birth of a Nation came out, this rejuvenated the Ku Klux Klan. And it was the Reverend William Joseph Simmons who created the second incarnation of the Ku Klux Klan in about October 1915. The Reverend William Joseph Simmons, a white minister who rejuvenates the Klan after seeing the movie, The Birth of a Nation, okay, which shows the Ku Klux Klan as the heroes of the movie and saving the nation from uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, rebellion former Union Negro soldiers because the movie takes place during slavery, reconstruction, and, uh, sorry, slavery, civil war, and reconstruction. All right. And all of the negative stereotypes of African-Americans at that time we saw in the movie, The Birth of a Nation. All right. So I deal with all that in, in, in the second class. But there's so much information, the way that I really wanted to deal with it, I had to do it in a, um, a, a second class. So we have a special bundle pack right now where you can register for a very limited time only. You can register for uh, both classes. All right. And that's at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We just posted a link here also. All right, now, uh, so check out pages 18 and 32 of Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. Now, 15 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence uh, were Freemasons, and 13 of the 39 signers of the U.S. Constitution were Freemasons as well. Uh, we deal with things like the Black Death, the Bubonic Plague, which uh, Europe loses between, it, it, it hits in spurts from 1347 to 1400. Europe loses 
between one quarter to one third of the population. OK, uh, you, you, it, during that period of time, 1347 to 1400, somewhere between 25 million to 75 million during that period of time. OK, over the course of five years. Europe is going to lose somewhere between 25 to 50 million people over the course of, uh, of five years from about 1347 to about uh, uh, 1352 or so. One of the worst plagues in history arrived at Europe's shores in 1347 common era, 1347 AD. Nearly 700 years after the Black Death swept through Europe, it still haunts uh, the world as the worst case scenario of an epidemic, before an epidemic, called the Great Mortality, as it caused its devastation, the second great pandemic of bubonic plague became known as the Black Death in the late 17th century. And these are some of the actual slides from the uh, online course that I teach. Now, modern genetic analysis suggests that the bubonic plague was caused by the bacterium Yersinia pestis or Y pestis. Chief among its symptoms, chief among its symptoms are painfully swollen, swollen lymph glands that form pus filled boils called uh, bobos. Um, sufferers also face fever, chills, headaches, shortness of breath, hemorrhaging, uh, blood uh, sputum, vomiting and delirium. And if it goes untreated, a survival rate of 50 percent. OK, history.com official website of the History Channel has some really good information on the bubonic plague, the Black Death. And it could go through and wipe out an entire village in seven days and you would literally cough up your lungs. OK, um, we talk about people like Massa Musa, who was the richest man in the world and became emperor of the Mali Empire in 1312 A.D., uh, there was a good article that showed a parallel between T'Challa, a Black Panther, who was the richest man in the Marvel comic universe, okay, uh, King of Wakanda, Black Panther, and Mansa Musa. Now, Mansa Musa becomes Emperor of the Mali Empire in 1312 AD. Uh, and this was a, a period of time when West Africa is, is uh, flourishing, but at the same time, uh, European nations were struggling due to raging civil wars and a lack of resources. But West Africa is flourishing. All right. So this is just uh, a brief synopsis of some of the information that we deal with in the online course. And of course, we talk about the, the Africans known as the Moors because we're dealing with the transatlantic slave trade, like I said in the beginning, you can't start in the mid 15th century. You have to deal with hundreds of years of history leading up to it. And you have to deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe uh, by the Africans known as the Moors. And the Moors go in in 711 AD uh, into the, the Iberian Peninsula, today known as Spain and Portugal, because it wasn't called Spain and Portugal back then. We know that uh, Jebel Tariq, OK, uh, they, they crossed the straits and they disembarked. At, at a at a huge uh, mountain uh, that they call Jebel Tariq or Tariq's mountain today is called Gibraltar or the Rock of Gibraltar. That's named after General Tariq Ibn Ziyad. OK. Um, and. OK, so this is some, if this, this is a good article that Renoko Rashidi wrote for Atlanta Black Star dot com. More saints, knights and kings, the African presence in medieval and renaissance Europe. And I, um, I use uh, his book, Black Star, the African Presence in Early Europe as one of the source as one of the uh, sources in, in the class as well. Now, we talked about uh, Christopher Columbus, Christopher Colombo. Columbus never came to the land we call the United States of America. The closest Columbus came here was uh, Cuba, which is 90 miles away. And recently in the news, we, we've heard about um, Cuba. Haiti, of course, an assassination of President Jovenel Moise, um, and then also Puerto Rico. These were all islands that Columbus conquered on behalf of the Spanish crown, okay, on his four voyages. So he set sail on his first of four voyages, August 3rd, 1492, on the Nina de Penta and the Santa Maria. 
He goes into the Bahamas, uh, which he calls San Salvador. He goes into Cuba uh, and Hispaniola. We know the western portion of the island of Hispaniola is uh, where Haiti is, or what the French call Saint Dominique. His second voyage, September 1493, he goes into the West Indies and uh, Puerto Rico, Boricuan, uh, and also Jamaica in 1494. 1498 goes into Trinidad and Venezuelan mainland in South, uh, South America, uh, May 1498. He dies in 1506. His last voyage, May 1504, he goes into Panama and Honduras. Okay. He never comes to the land that we call the United States of America. And one of the books we use in the class is uh, Christopher Columbus and the African Holocaust, Slavery and the Rise of European Capitalism by Dr. John Henry Clark. And I've got the book here. Uh, the book is somewhere here. Okay. The book is in one of these stacks here. And I've got a... I bought another bookshelf, so I've been rearranging things in the office. Oh, here it is here. Now, this is a. Now, your copy may have a different cover, but this is an old copy of it because this I got this in 1994. OK, Christopher Columbus and African Holocaust Slavery and the Rise of European Capitalism by Dr. John Henrik Clark. But Columbus and the Spanish, even though the Portuguese are the first ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade, uh, and the Portuguese dominate for the first 200 years, but Columbus and the Spanish are crucial to the transatlantic slave trade really exploding in, in uh, Columbus's four voyages. All right. So hopefully you like this type of information. Hopefully you learned something. Uh, share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network. And a YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. You can register for uh, this 10-week online course. We have a bundle pack right now um, where you can register for uh, uh, both classes at a, a huge discount, only $70. Regularly, it's regularly $130 each for a limited time only. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And um, right on the home page, just click right here, register here. As soon as you enroll, you can start watching the content. You can join us in our next class. So this class uh, meets on Sundays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime as well. Okay. Also, if you like this type of information, you can um, uh, support us through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App or through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Because I do the radio show six days a week. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, pay some of the bills, et cetera. And if you want to pay for the class through uh, Cash App, just email me and uh, you can do that as well. OK, email me at AHN show at African History Network dot com. AHN show at African History Network dot com or email me through the website and we can set that up for you also. All right. So uh, and, and once again, you can look, use this with your children. And something else that we use in the class is um, the study from the Southern Poverty Law Center, Teaching Hard History of American Slavery. Use a little bit of this as well. This is a good resource, Teaching Hard History of American Slavery. This study deals with how the uh, history of slavery is being incorrectly taught in schools all across the country. And it makes numerous recommendations how to better teach uh, the history of slavery. So hopefully you learned something today. Um, watch my show right here on Facebook and YouTube uh, and on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF Monday through Friday and uh, on Sundays, the African History Network show. And we have the information right on the homepage of our website dealing with that. All of my DVD lectures and digital downloads are at our website as well, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And uh, the show is on 10 different audio podcast platforms, iHeartRadio, CastBox, FM Player, TuneIn. So, uh, wherever you get your audio podcast from, just search for the African History Network show and uh, you can listen to the audio podcast of uh, of the shows that I do live. All right. We have to get out of here. Remember, the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And also is uh, uh, the day is Dr. John Henry Clark's birthday as well. And we know 
December 31st was uh, Dr. Yosef Ben Yakinen, uh, Yakinen's birthday uh, also. OK, so uh, two of our great grandmaster scholar warriors right now is correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win. We're kind of forever.